Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I am and we all are so pleased that you have chosen and joined with us and worship together this morning. And I hope and I continue to pray your family and your neighbor have a wonderful and healthier days, especially these days. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me, call to worship this morning. This is God's word. To us is given a vision of nations and races, land and people joined together in love. Praise, Praise be to God, in whose image we are created. We come to celebrate that vision, opening ourselves to the one who is its source and its life. We affirm in Christ that we are one family working together to bring about the realm of God. Come. 
Please join with me, call to confession and silent prayer. With all of our strength and all of our might, let us pray to God. O oh God, we confess our failures and call upon your strength. We acknowledge our brokenness and cry out for your healing. We examine ourselves and our sin is clearly before us. Hear our prayers that are too deep for words. O oh God, listen to your people praying. The assurance of God's pardon today. God says, I have heard the cries of my people, and I have come to deliver them. We believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are set free. 
from the power of sin and are given a new life. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you from California. Peace Christ, Christ be with you. Okay. Hi right there. The peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with, with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And now our reading from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The New Testament reading today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. 
It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see the temple of an idol, others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here ends our reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you have a problem, where do you go to get advice, to get help? Uh, for example, uh, sometime back our washing machine had a problem. We call the technician to come out and see about it. And you have to understand, we live in an old house with a very small utility room. So the dryer is stacked up on top of the washer. And it's right next to the wall and not very far from the other wall. There's a shelf over the top. And the, the service people said it would be my responsibility to get the dryer off the washer before they would come out. I didn't think I could do that. But my son checked out YouTube and found a how-to video that explained that the large wheeled trash bins that the city provides are, are just the right size. They're, they're about as wide as the dryer. They're about the right height. You can slide the dryer off on top of the bin and then hold it up and, and very carefully roll it out into the kitchen. So. Who would have thought a trash bin solves a problem? But now the New Testament church did not have YouTube, did not have the internet, uh, did not even have a denominational staff somewhere that, that could be consulted for problems. So what they did was write the Apostle Paul. And in 1 Corinthians, there are several places that that obviously are Paul's response to questions that they sent him. In, in chapter 7, for example, it says, Now concerning the things you wrote, and he goes on to give an answer. And then further on it says, Now concerning virgins, and he gives an answer. And, and then here in chapter 8, Now concerning food, meal, meat offered to idols. What's the problem? Obviously, we don't worry about food offered to idols, do we? In fact, someone joked that they had gone down to their grocery store and they didn't find any meat at all for sale that had been offered to idols. Pastor, could we just skip this chapter? No. No, we can't because even though the situation is strange to us, Paul's advice 
is very important in our age. Well, what's the situation? Well, in Corinth and many other places, there were temples and people came together to offer a sacrifice. And then after the sacrifice was made on the altar, that meat would be taken and used for banquets in the temple and sold in the butcher shops in town. Uh, in fact, archaeologists have discovered many temples that have special dining rooms all around. It, it's as if a church had been merged with a resort hotel. So what happens? If, if you are uh, affluent, probably you are invited to banquets in the temple. Even if you're not uh, worshiping there, you may be part of a dinner for, for a wedding or maybe the annual chamber of commerce banquet. Or if you are a silversmith, Perhaps uh, all the silversmiths in town get together once a month and have a lunch together, kind of like the Rotary, the Lions, and the other groups do today. So people ask Paul about that. They're not worshiping, they're just eating. And there's nothing wrong with that, the, the people thought, because after all, we have knowledge. We are mature Christians. We know, they said, that there is no God but the Lord God. All these things are, are, are idols. Uh, they don't amount to anything. So what difference does it make? It's not real. We're not worshiping. We're, we're, we're just having lunch. What, what's wrong with that? Paul said two things. One is you have to remember that not everyone is as mature as you are. Some new young Christians may be very confused by your behavior. Perhaps they have only recently become Christian. They have left their idols. They know that they do not worship all these many gods. They worship the Lord God and Him only. And then they see one of the elders of the church in the temple eating, and their faith is called into question. That They don't understand. These are the leaders of the church. How, how can they be in the temple? So Paul said, first of all, not everyone has the knowledge and the maturity that you do. Secondly, knowledge can puff up. It can make you arrogant. It can make you proud, make you feel that you are superior to these young Christians. And, and that's not good. So... What, what can you do? You can be concerned for the weak person. As Paul says, it really doesn't matter if you eat the meat or if you abstain from eating the meat. The concern is for the brother and the sister who may be weaker in faith than you are. And, and certainly, <clears throat> certainly that is a concern that is of value for us today. The, the traditional illustration of this passage is, is alcohol. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that you should not drink. In fact, there's a place that says, drink a little wine for your stomach. So that, there's nothing wrong with that. But what if this calls someone who, who had a drinking problem to relapse. That's where the problem comes in. That's the traditional illustration of this. You, you could talk about something else too. What if you invited a family over for dinner and, and you insisted that they have your fancy dessert that you spent hours preparing, even though you know 
that they're on a diet and they have medical problems that restrict what they can eat. Being knowledgeable, being mature, does not mean that you ignore the needs of the weak. It means that you act in love and in concern and in care for other people. We, we see this now, don't we? Uh, in some states where worship is restricted by law to only a few people or no one gathering in worship, there have been churches that have said, we defy the government, we believe in the Lord, we are going to worship no matter what. In a sense, that's true. Uh, we do have to give our first allegiance to God and not to something else. And, and yet think about that. If that pastor says, we ignore the government, we, we, don't, we don't care what the government says, does that mean that the church member can ignore the IRS and cheat on their taxes? Does that mean that you can go 120 miles an hour down the highway because the pastor said so? No, of course not. Of course not. Even if we have the law on our side, we need to act out of love. Think about how we are trying to live through the pandemic. There are people that have somehow turned protecting one another into a political issue. Do you wear a mask or do you not? Do you try to protect other people or do you say, nobody can make me wear a mask? And Paul is saying, love builds up. Love cares about the other person. Love does not claim its own rights. We could find other illustrations of, of how we should act out of love rather than freedom. Because Paul says we should not let our freedom become an occasion for creating a stumbling block for those who are weak. We should be concerned to act out of love. Ed Stetzer, who is the executive director of the Billy Graham Center for Evangelism at Wheaton College, has for a long time been concerned about the way some Christians have acted that have, have turned off people because he wants people to know of the grace of God and, and not to, to be turned off by people with, with, with strange notions. So a few days ago, he wrote a, a, a blog about the QAnon conspiracies, about people that have all these weird ideas and, and the effect that that is having on Christians. Uh, some of it is probably fairly innocent. I, I read, for example, that <clears throat> someone counted the number of flags in President Trump's uh, address right before he left for Florida. And, and they came up with the same number as the numerical value of Q. And therefore, they thought that President Trump was sending a secret message affirming the QAnons. How weird, how weird. But that's fairly innocent. But if you remember four or five years ago, QAnon promoted this conspiracy theory that uh, the elites of Washington were somehow running a, a sexual trafficking ring in the basement of a pizza parlor. Doesn't sound like that's uh, too serious, except a man took that seriously and came to town with a weapon and shot up the pizza parlor. Turned out no one was hurt. There was no basement where this was supposed to be taking place. It was, it was a totally false rumor. And yet, as Stetzer says, many 
Christian groups spread those rumors. And he talks about in this blog, uh, it's entitled, Waking Up After QAnon, How Can the Church Respond? Countless numbers were fooled, he says, resulting in untold damage to relationships, institutions, and families. What now remains is significant amounts of anger, distrust, and shame. So how do we as Christians respond? He says our immediate response must be to love them, those people who promoted these out of sight conspiracies. First response is to love them. Isn't that what Paul was saying? But then the second response is we must correct them. So the weak do not have the right to make the strong do what they want. After all, Paul agreed with the strong. They were correct that there is no God but the one God. They were correct that these idols were nothing, that meat was nothing. But Paul says that we must be concerned for the weak. And Ed Stetzer concludes with, we must maintain the tension of empathy, caring, but also conviction, of shepherding, but also correction. Knowledge can puff us up, make us arrogant in our power and our pride, and love, love builds up the body of Christ. This obviously was such a concern for Paul that he includes a whole chapter called the Hymn of Love. And and he concludes with this, faith, hope, love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. Make love your aim. In, In these times of controversy in politics and society, even within the church, we need to make love our aim. Whatever we do, think about how we relate to one another because we are all part of the family of God. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, We do give you thanks this day that we have come to know your love, your forgiveness for all of our weaknesses, and we pray that in love we may also be reaching out to lift up and support those who need our care. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
We are glad that you have joined with us in worship again this Sunday. We are but one part of God's church all over the world and in all different nationalities and, and uh, peoples. We are one part of God's church, and I hope you feel that you are part of God's people too. The grace of our Lord love of God, communion, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, abide with you and each one of us this day and each day. Amen. <laughs>